welcome back to another Red Hot podcast. We're here with Ariana and Cassie from Embody Health London. Thank you for coming today. Thank, Thank you so you. much for having us. It's all right. Um, so if you want to introduce yourself and a bit about um, your clinic and what you do, that would be amazing. Absolutely. Great. So my name is Ariana. I'm the Canadian of the duo. <laughs> and I, I, come from, yeah, so I come from Canada and I studied there and I decided to move to London where I met this lovely gem of a human, Cassie. Yes, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Cassie the other half of the duo here I am the Aussie so we kind of match made in heaven over here um, we met a couple of years ago in London and mm-hmm. we founded Embody Health London around nearly a year ago now yeah, and we specialize in eating disorders and body image yeah yeah mm-hmm. amazing I was saying to you guys I was reading on your website you do so much in your clinic and <laughs> help a lot of people it seems from all the, oh yeah um, client <laughs> reviews so um yeah I just wanted to learn a bit more about the mm-hmm. process you know how you when you you know meet a client and the process that you take them through to help them out with their um eating problems yes mm-hmm. well so many of the clients that we that come to us for, for our support they come from a history so we have a like you said varied approach mm-hmm. so we have two broader categories one of them will be women who have chronically dieted for for the majority of their life and they they've been kind of up and down you know the weight cycling yo-yo ba- dieting bandwagon and they're ready to move away from that and start healing their relationship with food to to start living a life that they absolutely love right so that means moving away from food rules kind of going back to our innate capacity to tune into our hunger our fullness and start trusting their bodies again so that's one one group of 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 our our major kind of clients base and then we also have the other side which are the clinical eating disorders Mm -hmm. so uh, you know that we can work with whether it's adolescents all the way to women who've been struggling for for quite a while in in hiding or perhaps not in hiding with with whether it be anorexia nervosa binge eating disorder bulimia and they're ready to start recovering from their eating disorders Mm -hmm. so we provide a very a, you know, nutrition, a therapeutic approach to, to dietetics to enable them to kind of start on that recovery process. Mm-hmm. So those are the two broader categories. Yep. And, and we work very closely with other health professionals as well to make sure that we do kind of look at them as a holistic person. Mm. Mm. Yeah. interesting yeah no um and you mentioned you touched upon then like um your approach is like intuitive eating am I yes. right so mm-hmm. ditching you know all these fad diets yeah. and just mm-hmm. kind of tuning absolutely. into your hunger singles, uh, signals right mm-hmm. yeah it's so important yeah right? absolutely yeah, yeah it's, going back to basics <laughs> going back to basics yeah which is almost stripped away from people from dieting as we think about diets they are this external influence this mm-hmm. external factor telling you what to eat when to eat and how much much to eat and when you take away that diet or that external rule you're left with yourself and you're thinking oh my gosh well am I hungry am I full what do I feel like eating I don't know what to do because I'm no longer at the mercy of this diet and so mm. it's rebuilding that inner trust they have with their internal signals and that just takes some time Mm, yes. yeah. It's an ongoing practice. When we yeah. talk about intuitive eating, in the same way that we say yoga is an ongoing practice, it's, there's mm. no way of being good or bad at it. It's really just a practice for life. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, and I mean, it's something that I actually looked into a lot as well. I think, you know, I think a lot of women go through, they... Um, almost want to just track everything they eat and like you yes. wrote about a blog about my fitness pal and yes. how that can yeah. be so negative <laughs> tracking all the <laughs> calories um, and macros so you would just would you say to people just shun any kind of tracking element of food um, mm. so it depends on on the client everything is going to be so unique the approach that we take will will depend on where they're they are at baseline so of course we we won't promote using mm-hmm. my fitness pal or mm-hmm. fitness trackers if if someone's presenting with very a toxic relationship with that mm-hmm. app right so some of our clients will come to us and say you know they cannot eat anything that's not in the app or if they haven't weighed it or measured mm-hmm. it perfectly that to fit mm-hmm. the category that the app provides then they're just it's a no go and that causes a lot of anxiety mm-hmm. so if that's the case and yes we work towards moving away from that to start kind of tuning inward instead of depending on this external resource mm-hmm. um, but of course if we're we're talking about healing your relationship then we would take baby steps to so that you know they're comfortable mm-hmm. with the change but mm-hmm. it's and it's not too overwhelming and as well, if we actually think about tracking, there are ways to do it that's actually quite helpful and informative. Mm. So with some of our clients, we will get them to 
write what they have weekly, you know, every in the day, talk about noting if they're hungry or full, where they're at, kind of we use this tool called the hunger fullness scale and we would mm -hmm. ask them to rate where they are before and after a meal. So it could be used in a very constructive way. So it's really, it, it all depends on the client. But yes, mm -hmm. there's a lot of research supporting how use of these fitness trackers is correlated with disordered eating patterns. Mm. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I also was uh, an avid reader of your blog apparently <laughs> now, but um, <laughs> so great. Yeah, <laughs> you no, know, I will be um, tuning in every day to see yeah. you. But um, glad to no, hear. it was it was super interesting because you were saying about um, sy sy systemic or systematic or something habituation. Habituation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. I was like, and if you could explain to the listeners what that was about, because I was like, that yeah. is that's just hit the nail on the head. That yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's it's a complex topic. Absolutely. Mm. And it's one of the areas that we tackle quite early on in our work with clients as it can feel really scary mm -hmm. because we think about going back to the clients who we work with, they present with a long list of perhaps food rules or anxiety provoking mm -hmm. foods. And they think, oh my gosh, I just can't trust myself around donuts. Are you kidding? I can't just eat donuts forever. Mm -hmm. I'm going to become a hippopotamus. It's not, it's not going to happen. And so we work with them through a process of habituation. And this is what we call a food exposure technique. Now to make it more relatable to, to your listeners, we can use different um, analogies. And one of my favorite ways to explain this with clients is like when you buy a new pair of shoes and it gets delivered and you're thinking, mm -hmm. oh, I love my shoes. I'm so excited. You wear your shoes every day for two weeks and you tell all your friends about these shoes. And then after two weeks, you still like your shoes, but they become part of, part of the wardrobe and they aren't so special and so excited, um, mm -hmm. so excitable. So it's really about normalizing food in the same way and habituating ourselves to these foods that we once feared or we feel that we can't control ourselves around. When we give ourselves permission to eat that food, we might find out that it's actually not that big a deal or we might not even like it as much as we thought we did. So it's a really interesting process and one that we work closely with clients. Um, as I mentioned before, that, that they do feel quite quite frightened and apprehensive in some cases, mm -hmm. um, but we really guide them through a step-by-step -step process and we provide them with support and one-to-one um, -one therapy, just if, if they're having a really difficult time with, with that. Yeah. It can yeah. be overwhelming, absolutely. It can be overwhelming. And it takes time. We always have to yeah. emphasize that. It's, yeah. yeah. We typically start with, you know, what we call food neutrality, right? Effectively, mm. this systematic habituation, this process mm. is what we use to get them to start neutralizing their attitudes towards certain foods, mm -hmm. right? So we, we typically get them to kind of write a list of of their, their food rules or food fears, foods that really cause anxiety, and we'll kind of go down the list one by one. Typically, after we, we start exposing them to, let's say, the third one, they kind of feel like they can expose yeah. themselves to, to many yeah. of them. Um, but yes, it can be overwhelming. So mm -hmm. it takes time and, and with practice and showing yourself, for example, if something, one of the common ones are a fear food is chocolate, it's thinking, mm. well, if I have a piece of chocolate, I'm just going to have the whole bar. I just can't control myself, yeah. right? So part of the, this habituation is building that sense of trust with yourself by exposing yourself slowly but surely and consistently. And once you start having it enough, you kind of start thinking, oh, yeah, okay, it's just chocolate, mm. right? No big deal. <laughs> so that's the idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like that is... Um, yeah, and you were saying keeping a donut in your handbag or something, and yes. I just thought it just <laughs> yeah. totally reframed this idea of you know food that you are scared of, you know, just making it a habit and seeing right. it more Definitely. often, then you become yeah. used to it. And Absolutely, it's exactly. normal and it's fine. Exactly. Yeah, um, and I think that also is quite relevant in terms of it's coming up to Christmas now, and mm. I think a lot of people. Mm. Um, I was on another podcast the other day, and um, he was saying uh, one of the guys on the podcast was saying how uh, we have this kind of mentality we put on weight over Christmas when we eat right. loads of food and then we have to kind of shed that shed it mm. um in um in summer and yeah mm. I just wanted to know your kind of idea on um on that yeah around Christmas yes I yes. can't first of all I can't believe it's Christmas <laughs> in like yeah. 10 weeks well, <laughs> first of all reality check yeah <laughs> yeah yeah definitely so um what what's interesting I'm wondering what your view is as well Ari but if we think about Christmas it often is associated with a break mm -hmm. and a pause and family time and mm -hmm. not working self-care more time with the kids and perhaps it might be 
over the year, apart from the summer break, one of the only times you get to switch off for that week. Um, of course, I mean, in Australia, it's summer, but in <laughs> this side of the world, it, it's winter and there is that kind of comfort level that could be associated with food. And um, food plays a really, really important role in family systems and culture. And it's really about celebration. So mm. it's really coming down to enjoying all of your favorite foods at Christmas and at the same time honoring how those foods make you feel and like like Ari said before that intuitive eating is a lifelong journey and it's normal for weight to fluctuate day to day week to week through different seasons through different stresses and with Christmas coming up our advice to clients is take it easy enjoy foods that you love respect how your body is feeling and just go back to normal once once it's over so it's really kind of like no big deal moving right. forward yeah mm. Yeah. Anything to add? They yeah. like girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Does yeah. that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, it definitely yeah. does. Yeah. I think I think it is and almost this thing you were saying about this fear of this fear of not being able to stop eating. Mm, but, yes. you know, um I think that a lot of people do experience that and um right. But you're right, it is it's a time of celebration and a week, yeah, you know, exactly. isn't gonna make that much of an impact really on exactly. it. That's long term. Oh, it's a blimp in the scheme of life, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that's it. The fear of overeating often comes from being presented with foods that perhaps are special to Christmas. Mm. Like, what's the one Mince here? pies. Mince pies. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I did learn this last year, I swear. Do you mince pies? I have had it. I just forgot the name because it's oh. not part of my culture. Sorry. Um, but yes, it's one of those things where I know at this time of year, my clients will say, oh my gosh, I just can't control mm. myself. And the same thing applies if we think about applying habituation to this. Of course, it comes out this time of year. You haven't had it in ages. So that desirability increases. So mm. it makes total sense mm. that, that there's that sense of, oh my gosh, I need to take advantage of this time mm. of year. And yes, that's perhaps why clients may present with that fear of overeating. Yeah. But, but like Cassie said, it's it's part of enjoying, right? Part mm. of eating and healing your relationship with food is also making sure that you're satisfied and that you enjoy the foods that you are eating mm. so so it's thinking about all of these these elements mm. in terms of how much you're eating you know what satisfies you and eating the foods that you love it's mm. totally okay yeah definitely yeah the funny <laughs> thing is i told this i we were chatting about this with my client last week and we said if you tried really hard you could find mince pies in july I mean, <laughs> mince pies aren't under the same only idea. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you love them that much, I'm sure we can make this a, a reality in your life every day. Why not? What's stopping you? Mm. Yeah, that's right. Or just make them. Yeah, <laughs> just you got make, it. Why not? Yeah, mince pies all year round. That's it. Then we can habituate for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that just reminded me of the Percy Pig um, mince pie in M&A. Sorry, unrelated, <laughs> but I was I would just have to try them. Very excited. Oh, I have to do oh, that. Oh, we too. Yeah, well. okay. Percy Pig mince pie. Interesting. <laughs> Noted. Um, and I also wanted to get your opinion on on Instagram. You're quite big on Instagram. Yeah. Love yourself as well. I've been following you, um, guys. <laughs> Thank um, you. And. You know this 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 trend of uh, what I eat in a day on mm, Instagram. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's quite a toxic and negative thing that is on social media? Yeah, D- <laughs> yeah. We're looking for yeah. yeah, really good question. We actually yes. posted about this quite recently. Like, yeah, I think I think last week mm, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as essentially our a lot of our Instagram posts are inspired by conversations with our clients Mm. and our aim is to be as helpful as we can be for our clients and what the common theme that is emerging from these types of videos is comparisons Mm. and oh my gosh to look like her I should eat what she is eating or oh my gosh I eat way too much I should cut back and it Essentially, it's going back to that external reference. Like diets, we start to compare ourselves to external uh, representations of what food is meant to look like, and then we don't trust ourselves. Now, on the contrary to that, we also have clients who say, I actually find it helpful because I get inspired by mm-hmm. recipes and different ideas and portion size guidelines. So we're definitely, we, we have kind of, you know, a foot in both camps I think we're not totally against them Um, but at the same time in regards to the clients that we work with it is quite unhelpful because it Mm. does lead them down that trap of oh my gosh I'm not eating what she is eating Mm. 
So yeah, and I think it's important to to make note that mm. when you see what someone eats in one particular day, it do, it doesn't really represent what they what it looks mm. like in terms of the week, what they've had yesterday, what they're going to have tomorrow, how much exercise they've done. It's really hard to paint a full picture, mm. and I think that's the thing with Instagram. We have to be very careful with what kind of information we're consuming because we can. It's easy to just see snapshots of reality and kind of try to take. That and apply it to our life when we don't actually know the greater context mm. so that that's the thing we kind of try to stay away from but of course if it's if it's helpful then it, it's it's contextual yes yeah. <laughs> every person's but, so unique and it depends on who, who's sharing it as well is it a you know a professional who has a really positive relationship with food um, and what are they actually sharing how are they sharing it whereas if it's potentially potentially not all fitness influencers are like this but potentially it can be you know quite disordered mm. uh, quite a disordered relationship with food that we actually see and there, there's actually been a study on this that um, I recently read where um, there are more accounts that are coming out the majority of these what I eat in a day posts are actually demonstrating disordered eating and and too little calories for the majority of the population and what they need to meet their need their daily needs yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so yeah it's, it's mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah I think, just to be weary of, yeah right? I know definitely when, exactly. you, when you consume information really mm. yeah, yeah yeah I think I think that it is it's this comparison everyone's different you know everyone has different body yeah. shapes body sizes right. you know different mm-hmm. heights which all obviously we have to take into account and of affects course. what we need to eat in a day and the amount of calories but um, exactly yeah I also was wondering if you could probably explain to the listeners a bit about the negative impacts of eating a thousand calories, one thousand two hundred calories mm. a day, does it have a really negative impact on your obviously mentally, but also your body itself physically? Yes, that, that, that's a great question, and and that's something that we certainly address quite a lot. And just a little fun fact for for your listeners <laughs> is that roughly about twelve hundred calories, which is is the average diet out there. Mm is is the daily requirement of a two-year-old so that mm-hmm. kind of puts some things into perspective yeah. right when we, mm-hmm. like you said our weight our height we have so many different needs but what we do know is that we need more than a two-year-old mm-hmm. <laughs> that's for <laughs> sure um but and ultimately when we're undernourishing over time what we can start seeing are metabolic changes so there's a lot that happens to the body because effectively the body's thinking oh my gosh what's happening i'm not receiving enough energy mm-hmm. i can't undergo my major critical functions properly so ring the alarm right ring the alarm all these processes start changing so what we can start seeing and Cassie I'm happy for you to chip in as well because there's so much so if I miss a few because there's so many things that start (laughs) happening Uh, but but for example one of the first things that may may happen is your your body starts reprioritizing where it's actually giving energy right Mm -hmm. what it what it's using energy for so what we can start seeing for people who are undernourished over time when they follow such a diet is um, that they're, they may feel kind of bloated when they start, mm-hmm. when they lose re- a lot of weight and more bloating, they may be more constipated. I don't know if, you know, poop talk, not many people <laughs> like to talk about that, but hey, they may start feeling that because actually we start degrading our muscles, right? Mm-hmm. That's one of the first things that we start breaking down. So when we start re- eliminating many food groups or just overall consumption, we start, the body thinks it's easier actually to break down protein, things like your muscles, than it is to break down fat, believe it or not. So your key lean mass, that's really important for metabolism, is being broken down. So that means that we actually put you in a worse position than you actually started off with before starting this diet. Um, So your metabolism gets affected, your gut muscles get affected, which is why they kind of almost get paralyzed in a way. They don't want to use as much energy to move things along mm-hmm. the digestive tract mm-hmm. so you may start feeling bloating constipation um, and some people lose their period some women will lose their period because they actually lose mm-hmm. too many fat stores as well so mm-hmm. the body's thinking I'm not safe I'm not in a safe place I can't bear a child for example so fertility goes down change in mood happens mm-hmm. I mean so many different things mm-hmm. happen bone density bone density yeah. your bones start getting broken down mm-hmm. so as many of our clients who've been on very restrictive diets for quite a while they may even be diagnosed with osteoporosis at the mm. age of sometimes 17, 20s. Mm. 
And that's what, something that you would often be diagnosed with in, you know, elderly, in your yeah. elderly years. Mm. So it's quite interesting. It's quite, it has a severe impact on, yeah. on overall all of the systems in the body. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. But Anything else? Well I mean, said. Yeah. So many things. <laughs> yeah. Libido gets affected really? as well. I mean, so many yeah. things. Yeah. 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 Oh, gosh, yeah. All so, these things are important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Essentially, the body's in survival mode. That's and me. with limited calories over a long period of time, it shuts down non-essential processes. Mm-hmm. Like like Ari mentioned, reproduction, digestion, bone density, to keep your brain functioning, your heart, heart. beating, and your lungs breathing. So yeah. it just goes, okay, critical, w- what can we support here? Let's go and support those important parts of our body, and mm. the bones can wait. Yeah. Oh gosh. It, it's, it's serious. It's yeah. really yeah. serious. No, definitely. I didn't yeah. even quite know the extent to which yeah. it was. And we're yeah. speaking, speaking more long term. I mean, yes. it's the average female diets for about two to three weeks sometimes mm-hmm. longer term based on their situation we're talking mm-hmm. more kind of critical low Long-term, energy availability yeah yeah, yeah. 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 okay and then from you know if if someone has experienced uh you know this diet uh, mentality and they've gone yep. through this um you know negative process with food um is that when you promote like intuitive eating would you say would you raise their calories to a lot of a mm. higher amount or how do you uh, go about you know bringing them to um, yeah. a kind of normal level of food mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah it's a good question good, good question question. yeah i mean it depends on the person yes. first of all and and their yes. history and what they're presenting with mm-hmm. how long they've been dieting for how much weight they have lost recently in, mm-hmm. in the last six months or so so f- for a lot of our clients intuitive eating isn't the first go-to mm-hmm. as the first point of call is weight restoration and getting getting their period back for mm-hmm. example yes. restoring bone density rebuilding their lean muscle mass and then from there down the line as they start to become more attuned with their hunger and fullness cues for example which get totally diminished over a a period of dieting we can then think about intuitive eating and that's where we tune into hunger cues fullness cues satisfaction but before that weight restoration is number one priority if they are absolutely yes yeah uh, if they present underweight yes as as we were kind of talking about yeah Mm. so that's the thing with intuitive eating it's not it depends on where they are on the journey. Mm. We'll always, there's so, if we think about intuitive eating, there are 10 principles. So many of the principles will be weaved in mm. all of our clients' approaches. But when we think about the more clinical cases, as Cassie mentioned, if they're severely underweight already, we wouldn't be thinking about hunger and fullness and to, tapping into that. Yeah. That wouldn't be appropriate in this population. Not yet, anyways, mm-hmm. because ultimately we can't trust those cues yet because your body's not yeah. in a safe space yeah. yet. So, so that would be something to bear in mind. Yeah. But of course, for anyone who, let's say, you know, still has their period, they've just been on diets and they're ready to kind of renew their relationship mm-hmm. with food, totally, yeah, intuitive eating would be one of the, the go-tos for sure. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, I've been on like a crash course of uh, <laughs> yeah. and I'm loving it. Um, amazing. In such a short space of time. It's great. Um, and I also wanted to ask you a bit about your um, clinic itself. You Did you set it up, was it a year ago or something you said? It was approximately nearly a year ago. Yeah, almost, yeah c- c- Coming up to a year. We're going to have to yeah. celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the funny thing is, Kate, is that we actually had a clinic for six weeks and then COVID hit. Yes. And so we became Gosh. a totally virtual clinic. Oh, that's right. And just, just given the current status quo of, of the the world the country mm. we will be remaining online for the foreseeable future really yes yeah, okay. yeah. so big adjustment it was like a <laughs> massive high massive low massive high again <laughs> so we had to adjust quickly as but, i'm sure everyone right yeah has, but yes, it definitely was an adjustment definitely sure. yeah <laughs> so we run all of our consults via zoom mm. now and we, we see two types of people as ari said we have two kind of um kind of buckets of clients who we work with and we also work with clients on a one-to-one basis or mm-hmm. in our intuitive eating group program and it just depends on their personal circumstances what they're hoping to achieve by working with us but both programs are for a 12-week period mm-hmm. um, so clients with active eating disorders are appropriate for the intuitive eating group program as mm-hmm. we discussed the, mm-hmm. the, the reasons earlier before um, but yeah so 12 weeks as there is a lot to unpack mm-hmm. you know humans are complex and we take a very therapeutic approach with it with our work with our clients and sometimes I go with sessions and we don't even mention food once That's because right. <laughs> we're talking really about their their life and, and the role of food in their life their relationship with their body mm-hmm. we talk about their upbringing uh, did their parents diet how was it what was the influence from their peers their teachers mm-hmm. their grandparents like we we are made up of so many different experiences that to understand 
what might be limiting us now, we need to go back in time and think, well, where did this all come from? Mm. Where, did, where did this story come from? What are these beliefs and these rules and how can we um, challenge them or understand their intention? So it depends, it depends on, on the person, but Absolutely. one-to-one that's very, very therapeutic. Um, and in our group program, again, all run via Zoom, we work with some fabulous women who are ready yes. to ditch dieting and live a life of, of diet freedom. I mean, it sounds, sounds cliche, but the, the aim, the dream, the, the dream <laughs> to, to no longer be living your life according to an app or a book or, or a scales. diet or mm-hmm. yeah it's exactly right it's it's giving them all the tools and the skills they need to trust themselves at yes. the end of the day so, so we take a very practical approach so yeah. of course it's very therapeutic in nature mm-hmm. and and that's where our kind of weekly coaching whether it be in the one-to-one sessions mm-hmm. for example we still provide worksheets for example really tangible tools that they can start bringing into their day-to-day and it's like little homework shall we say mm-hmm. right it's, it's, it's a self-directed <laughs> yeah. um kind of therapy within our sessions between the times that we see our clients so at least they have something to do and then yeah it's very unique it's always going to be tailored to their needs needs their history as Cassie mentioned what we also find is there's a really tight relationship with eating disorders and and trauma for example Mm -hmm. so we'll often work closely and we collaborate with other health professionals very closely on these types of cases so it's not just just Cassie and I we also love to work in what we call a multidisciplinary setting Mm -hmm. as well so we have all the experts on board (laughs) yeah (laughs) to make sure that the client gets what they need fabulous yeah mm-hmm. that sounds amazing and well your instagram is great and your blog <laughs> is great you. and your, everything it seems to be going really well for you guys so thank yeah you so much best Kate. of luck for the yeah. future thank you so much um, i know just uh, this uh, will allow you the space if you want to say anything yes. else the listeners anything else sure yeah, yeah absolutely i mean Thank you so much for complimenting yes. our Instagram and so social. So for your listeners, if they're interested and they'd love to, to kind of follow along and learn more about what we do, as we just kind of talked about, we do provide, we, we give away free resources sometimes, but we, we love to teach really through through our uh, our posts. Mm-hmm. So you can find us at, at Embody Health London underscore on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, Embody is E-M-B-O-D-Y. Sometimes yes. people think it's in body, but no, it's M-Body. <laughs> M-Body. <laughs> With my accent, maybe someone else should say it. Yeah. And it's in Body yeah. Health London on TikTok as well. Yeah. Um, we bit. love to dance. Yeah. We're also yeah. known as the dancing dietitians. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> or, yeah. And it's, yeah, we, we got literally just asked to be wellbeing ambassadors for TikTok the other day. We thought that was oh so, my yeah. gosh. Wow. We're literally like, okay, sure. I'll take known that. as the dancing yeah. dietitians. Yeah. So that's a little fun tip. <laughs> yeah. A little fact. I thought it was great. Absolutely. All about building mental health awareness. Yes all yes. about it so yes. yes we look forward to seeing your listeners there and thank you so much thanks for having us no, thanks.